This is uh, President Andy Armacost, and thanks for joining us here on Star Wars Day. And let me offer, may the fourth be with you. And uh, we in the Armacost family, of course, are huge fans of, of the sequence of movies and uh, the force is strong in our family. So um, anyhow, we hope you're all doing great. Thank you so much for tuning in and uh, for, for being here to ask questions and, and hopefully we give you great answers tonight. And I know that there's a lot on everybody's mind. Uh, it's the end of the school year where we're getting ready to graduate uh, so many uh, great undergraduate and graduate students and uh, really honor them. We had a great event on Saturday. It was called the Grad Walk. So in place of our formal grad, uh, formal commencement ceremony, um, Vice President Linder and her, her staff, uh, Fred Whitman, put on a, a wonderful event where we uh, welcomed and honored uh, over 500 of our graduating students. So it was a really nice way to, to congratulate them. And the videos from that will be, the individual videos will be embedded within the, the virtual commencement ceremony. So for any parents of, of graduates, um, uh, please tune in on, on May 15th to see that virtual commencement ceremony. A lot happening on campus. Um, uh, we're eager to hear all of your questions. I know there, there'll be a lot of questions uh, likely about uh, reopening the campus in the fall and, and what the status of the campus will be. And just know um, we're moving ahead towards a, a full opening in the fall semester. Classes uh, are, we're planning to have them as normal as they were in the fall of 2019. Uh, of course, there's caveats to a statement like that. Um, and that is, um, we'll see what happens uh, with the pandemic. And there's one way uh, that I think collectively we can all mitigate the risks of the pandemic. And that is, um, seek out and get your vaccinations. Uh, and let me urge every member of our campus to do exactly that. And, uh, and if, we, uh, if we all do that, uh, then we'll be in a much better place in the fall semester. Uh, the, the question of whether we'll be wearing masks uh, always comes up as well. And uh, we'll, we, had, we just have to wait and see what the condition of the pandemic is and what the CDC's uh, telling us and, and kind of what the level of vaccination is on the campus. And we'll make a judgment. And we'll make that call probably around the 1st of August. And I know for, for practical reasons, uh, that might influence your packing uh, as you come back to school because you've got to leave a little extra room for face masks, I suppose. But, uh, you know, it's it, we'll make a, a call based on the, the available data and the evidence that we have. So uh, we'll just stay tuned. Um, but over the summers, we'll still uh, require the face coverings on campus uh, throughout all the activities that are going on then. So um, so that's a little bit of uh, upfront information because I know those were issues that you're facing. But let me let me thank each and every one of you for, for bearing with us or bearing with um, what we're seeing uh, this entire year of the pandemic. You've done uh, amazing work. You've been patient. Uh, you've listened to the advice that we've given and uh, we truly appreciate it. I truly appreciate it. So so keep up the hard work. You got um, students, you've got another, what week and a half left uh, before uh, the semester closes down. And thanks to you in particular for your hard work and keeping great spirits alive. Um, and uh, with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Uh, Cassie Gerhardt, who's gonna uh, lead tonight's event and, and really um, shuffle through a lot of questions and get you the answers that you deserve. So Cassie, over to you. Thanks, President Armacost. Um, as we've done in the past, we, we want to get your questions answered as the president said. So please feel free to start adding those to the Q&A feature and um, we will do as many of those and answer as many of those as we can live. Some of my colleagues, if they are more individual and specific may answer those in the chat, but we'll do what we can to get those all answered live. Once again, we are recording this session and we will get it posted online in the very near future. And I will ask my colleagues, um, some of whom you probably, our listeners all um, know by name and title, but before you answer a question, if you could introduce yourself um, for perspective, we would appreciate it. We did get a few questions submitted in advance of this session, whether from parents or even our student government leaders actually submitted a few. So I'm gonna start with some of those pre-submitted questions while you all submit your other questions and maybe some of these um, will answer um, some of your questions. President Armacost, I'm going to start with the um, question I think many of us get every day, and that is about vaccinations and really the mandating of vaccinations. So can UND mandate vaccinations and will we mandate vaccinations for students coming back this fall? The answer is no. We don't have the authority to do this. This would require legislative and state board action. And currently, Legislation um, has a limited number of vaccines uh, that are on that list. Uh, the COVID vaccination is not one of them. And uh, there's currently no plans to add that to the list. So, um, so I don't anticipate a requirement um, uh, for vaccinations on campus for COVID anytime soon. So thanks. Thank you. 
Dr. Hallgren, I am going to give this question to you, given Student Health Services reports to you. Can you visit a little bit about what vaccination opportunities will be, will be available in the fall and maybe even highlight what vaccination opportunities are currently available to members of the campus community? Thanks, Cassie. My name is Kara Hallgren. I serve as the Vice President for Student Affairs and Diversity here at UND. And actually, I think my colleague is by far better versed to be able to answer that question. So I would like to introduce Rosie Dube. Thank you, Kara. I'm Rosie Dube and currently serving as the Director of COVID, UND COVID Clinical Response. Um, we have very robust vaccination opportunities existing on campus. Um, I am speaking for my colleague, Jeff Stody, who's the Director of Student Health Services. There is a vaccine clinic, or there was a vaccine clinic today, and there's a vaccine clinic on Friday available. Anybody who would like vaccines, students, faculty, or staff at this time, please call Student Health at 777-4500, and they will arrange to get you vaccinated um, as vaccines become available, and I believe that they have some in-house ready to go. Um, the, the response this fall, um, I believe that Jess and her team plan to be available during orientation days to provide vaccines, perhaps, if people are interested at that time. And please be assured that once school starts this fall and before fall, uh, there will be vaccination opportunities by calling Student Health um, at any time. So yes, you can get vaccination on campus and we highly encourage it. Great, thanks Rosie and Kara. Karen, um, as I kind of cued you in before we even began, lots of questions about um, what the academic environment will look like this fall. And so um, can you visit about a few things? So what will the fall semester look like? Um, do we have an idea of how many classes will be hybrid versus in-person? Um, you know, some people have felt that we said we were gonna have in-person this spring and maybe more of those have been hybrid than they anticipated. So can you just visit about what are the plans related to the academic environment for the fall semester? Sure. Hi everyone, I'm Karen Plum, Vice Provost for Student Success. So for this fall, we will have courses that are listed as either in-person, uh, hybrid or online. Students can see how their course delivery mode uh, has been set up for each class as they register in Campus Connection. Um, one point I do want to clarify is our hybrid courses for the fall semester. The expectation is that the instructor will be live in the classroom and that students would have the choice in those courses to be live in the classroom as well with the instructor or they can choose to participate remotely. Uh, what we're hoping to do with some of those courses is to give students a little bit more of an option. Some of our students want all in-person courses and some of our students want all online courses still. So a little bit of flexibility built in there. Um, if you're looking for either of those, I would encourage you to work with your advisor um, to take a look at what your scheduling options are and the different courses that are available across campus. Right now, we have 77% of all of our courses listed as either in-person or hybrid. So we have a lot of opportunities for students to be back in the classroom. Um, as we kind of mentioned earlier, that may change. Um, if an instructor, for example, were to test positive or were to be a close contact, a course may need to switch to online for a short period of time or potentially for the semester, depending on the situation. We have asked our instructors to be flexible with that kind of, of delivery. Uh, the other thing that I want to touch on a little bit is the availability for students to seek out and talk to their advisors. Um, we will have a new advising learning services and tutoring center on the second floor of McCann Hall in the fall semester, which is right across from where the new Memorial Union will be. So it will be a great opportunity for students who just have a quick question or weren't sure if they could get in with an appointment for their advisor to pop in and ask those questions and um, talk to somebody about uh, questions they have about courses or what to do uh, in a particular course. Thanks, Karen. Orlin, a question for you. A question about what will the dining centers look like um, in the fall semester? Thanks, Cassie. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm Orlin Rosas, I'm the Director of Dining Services. And you know, I need to state as, as we're planning to, to open the dining centers more along the traditional lines of pre-COVID. Uh, the seating capacity will go back to, you know, 100%. Uh, we're looking at uh, utilizing China versus takeout. 
our uh, yeah, takeout containers. And then also, of course, uh, we're looking at also going back to where students would be able to self-service some of the items and also that we would <clears throat> be able to do customizable entrees and such for students. So, you know, of course, it's all predicated on, you know, where the campus is at at that point in time. Obviously, if the campus is back to normal, we'll be back to normal. And if the campus is not, we'll, we'll adjust our plans accordingly. Thanks, Cassie. Thanks, Arlen. It's the little things of looking forward to eating off of a plate in the fall semester that many of us look most forward to. So thanks, Orlin. Someday there will be a trivia question of how many disposable clamshell containers um, UND Dining went through this year. And we can get that answer for you. I know you can. I know you have that number. So thanks, Orlin. Kara, question for you. Will the Angel Fund still be available to apply for um, as we move forward? Yes, it will be available. Uh, you know, one of the, out of every, out of every challenge comes opportunity, right? And so one of the greatest things to come out of, of the last year of COVID is the development of this angel fund. And yes, it will continue to be available. And it, it continues to uh, just make me feel so proud to be a part of UND because of the faculty, staff, and students, and friends of the university who contribute to the Angel Fund, which then in turn allows for students to get that extra financial support that they may need. So yes, it's available. And um, if you are interested in making a donation, by all means, let me know. I'll hook you up. Thanks, Dr. Hallgren. All right, Jed, it is your favorite subject of all subjects, and that's parking. So I know this is your favorite subject of all subjects. So this one is for you. Um, I'm going to just read it the way it was submitted to me. It says, the parking, it is very hard to know where to park. There's no parking at the Wellness Center. Can you please explain the difference between the $190 parking pass and the $400 pass? Can the campus <laughs> patrol ease up on this? It is hard to find parking and these kids have no extra expendable money while they're in school. So I'm, I, I really am not, in a, not the right person to go into the minutia of parking, even though it is my most favorite thing to talk about. So thank you so much for that, Cassie. And uh, so what I will do is um, I'm gonna make sure that people who are in a much better position to me to answer the question exactly will provide that response. Uh, and that one of those people is uh, actually off traveling on university business to Bismarck. So he, I think probably planned it so that he wouldn't be around to answer this question. But anyway, uh, but seriously though, I think one of the things that we're really doing is uh, actually trying to make parking a little bit smoother for people. And we're, uh, you know, eliminating some of the, um, you know, the various categories making parking uh, more available rather than less available and really doing a lot of work to create additional parking in key places. But in terms of the specifics of the pricing and everything, uh, I'm gonna I have to punt that one and, uh, and but we'll get you know, specific answers for people who are asking that question. Jed, this is Josh. How, how will people get be able to access that information? For that question specifically, uh, Dr. Wynn, I know who sent that one. And so once we get that response, I can follow up with the parent. That one was pre-submitted to me, actually. So I can good. follow up specifically. Yeah. Thank you. And Just we'll be, you know, I think that's it. information that we'll easily be able to publish. So that's that's not a big deal. I, I will clarify, while we have had some limitations at the Wellness Center, some changes have been made over the semester. Um, starting this spring, we worked with Mike Peeper, and so that one may have been resolved. But like, as um, Vice President Shiver said, we'll follow up. And again, I know who submitted that question, Jed, so we can follow up. President Thank Armacost, I, thanks, Jed. I'm going to come back to you, and it was something you said at the beginning. Um, I've got another question about wearing masks, and I know some people have joined us um, since you initially greeted everyone. Can you just provide an update again about where you think masks are and perhaps um, the August 1 timeline for providing some additional information for those who maybe joined us after you shared opening comments? Sure. Um, when we think about the prevention measures that have been so effective during this pandemic, a number of things have come up, keeping your distance, washing your hands, uh, wearing a face covering. And, um, and we don't yet know, uh, you know, Josh Wynn can talk about this, Dr. Wynn um, can probably comment on transmissibility of the virus, even for people who are vaccinated. And there's just a lot that's 
that's not yet known. And so um, in terms of how that impacts uh, face coverings on campus, we're gonna continue to wear them through the summer. Uh, and we don't know yet about the fall and uh, it will depend upon the conditions of the pandemic. It will depend upon levels of vaccination on campus and a number of other factors. And we'll make that judgment on the 1st of August and we'll let everybody know so that you have plenty of time to prepare either to bring your masks to campus or not. So um, so it, it should be, um, you know, we should have more information. We will have more information at that point and uh, we'll make that decision on the 1st of August. So um, yeah, it, again, it's a, it's a great, it's a great measure um, if, if there's uncertainty about the spread of the pandemic. Thanks, President Armacost. Troy, a question for you. What is the plan for a safe move out this spring semester and in particular um, University Place? Thanks, Cassie. My name is Troy Nolder, Director of Housing and Residence Life. Um, so for our checkout process, the, the main, the key thing is to communicate with your resident assistant. Um, we are doing, offering both a traditional checkout for those who want to schedule a time, um, turn in their keys and review their inventory and condition with their RA. If a student feels that they would either do more of a contactless, um, turn their key in separately and, and not be present with an RA, we can schedule that as well. Um, of course, all of our staff will be fully masked and we'll, we'll respect social distancing throughout. Um, the main thing though for us is just to communicate that um, checkout time so that we know when you're leaving. We can make sure that we get all your paperwork done, get you um, checked out of the room properly and, and get ready to turn over for the summer session for us. So um, other than that, pretty much a standard process and most of our students schedule checkouts spread out over the week. Um, so students will leave as soon as their finals are done, so. Thanks, Troy. Um, Rosie, a question about um, vaccinations and if people are able to get a first vaccine here, should they, knowing that they might need to get the second vaccine um, after they return home and maybe in another state, thoughts on just kind of the, the timeline for vaccinations? Sure. Um, first of all, I wanna correct a comment I made earlier. The student health vaccination clinics are tomorrow, Wednesday and Friday. I got mixed up and thought today was Wednesday. Sorry about that. The clinics are Wednesday and Friday. As far as the vaccination, our general mantra has been get the first vaccine you can. So with that thought, we would say get vaccinated here as soon as, as, as you can. The important thing to know is if you do get vaccinated here and you're home for the second dose, you need to take your vaccination card and make sure you finish the series with the series you started. So if you get Pfizer here and you need the second dose in three weeks at home, you need to get a Pfizer dose. Likewise, if you get Moderna here, you need to get Moderna when you go home. Um, the other vaccine that we are, sorry, we have a dog, me too. Um, the other vaccine that we are, on Friday, the J&J, &J, the one dose vaccine is available. And um, that has been released again by the FDA and we are still encouraging students to consider that one. Um, as a parent myself, my kids are well past the college age. However, I gave some thought when I, that question was posed that, you know, it's not unlikely that students may not feel well for a day or two following their vaccine. Some don't know this at all. Some don't feel very well. Um, that's something you might want to talk to a provider at Student Health or someone about, you know, with finals this week. Uh, I, you know, I just don't know for sure. Um, that's a personal choice if you, some people put it off if they have a really big test or event coming up. So you might want to give that some consideration to time your shots so that you can afford to take a day off, and just kind of lay around and, and uh, feel better. Does that answer your question? Please let me know if not. I think that does, Rosie, thank you. Matt Lukacs, I've got a question for you. Are there any scholarships or funds such as the Angel Fund available to financially struggling international students? Uh, yes, hi, my name is Matt Lukacs. I am the Director of One Stop Student Services and Recruitment at UND. And Cassie, yes, we do have other funds um, that for international students to uh, apply for. Um, it's called the Open Door Scholarship. And it's been just a simple application on the One Stop Student Services website. So that's a very good option for international students. 
And to clarify, the angel fund is also available to international students should they apply. Great, thanks. Dr. Hallgren, a question for you as people plan the fall semester, is family weekend happening this fall? Put it this way, we are planning for it to happen unless we hear otherwise. So how's that, how's that sound? So yes, we are, we are busy planning family weekend. Um, we are anxious to have people on campus. We also recognize that um, we are making, I am saying this today, given what I know right now. And so we will do our best to follow through with that this fall. And given Family Weekend reports to me, we are planning it for the weekend of October 8th through 10th. So if all the things that Dr. Hallgren said are in, case, um, in place, but the weekend you can mark your calendars as October 8th through the 10th this year with more information to come in the future. Um, next question. Um, question, and Jen, I'm going to send this one to you. So if parking isn't your favorite one, maybe face coverings will be the next subject for you. Um, Face coverings are still required indoors on campus, correct? This person adds, last week there was a class in O'Kelly Hall. Among the five to six students I could see through the glass doors, none was wearing a face covering, wondering what's going on. So could you just clarify where we're at with face coverings, especially in light of what people are hearing related to face coverings and vaccinations? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, right now, uh, first of all, it's wonderful that we have some of this ambiguity around because it shows how much progress we've made in the last, you know, a few months. I mean, that's really something to rejoice uh, from my perspective. But really, we really still are functioning under a mask mandate here on campus. And the reason is, and Dr. Wynn, I'm gonna turn to him afterwards to maybe ask him to comment is, you know, there still is the possibility of transmitting the disease. So, you know, I think the most effective way of dealing with it is to continue to wear masks, at least at this time. And, uh, and when you look at the latest CDC guidelines, uh, you see that people are able to engage in all kinds of activities, including uh, fully uh, occupied uh, church services, uh, singing in a choir, attending a class. Uh, but the recommendation from the CDC is that you continue to wear a mask. So I think that's something that we uh, really wanna keep in mind. Uh, are all systems perfect? You know, uh, I think I said long, long ago, we're not the mask police around here. So we really expect people to comply. Uh, I imagine from time to time, there are those who don't. And uh, perhaps the questioner uh, spotted one of those instances. But generally speaking, I think people are still basically complying. And so recognizing that no system is perfect, I think uh, in general, uh, given the number of people that we have on campus right now, uh, we're not doing too badly in continuing with our mask mandate. Jed, let me, this is Andy Armacost, the president. Um, there's another element to this as well, and that is um, uh, personal private medical information that some people may choose to vaccinate or not uh, to vaccinate. And um, in order, the CDC guidance says if everybody in a indoor setting is vaccinated, then, um, then they can go without masks. However, um, on campus, I, I don't want faculty or staff um, posing that question to students or other, or other colleagues as well, um, simply because um, it's, it's not their business, right? And, and so, um, so right now at this point, another reason to keep the mask mandate in place is just to protect the privacy of the people who uh, might not be vaccinated or those who are vaccinated, but wish to uh, continue being uh, extra precautious. Hey, this is Josh Wynn, Vice President for Health Affairs and Dean of the UND School of Medicine and Health Sciences. And I would just expand on President Armacost's uh, comments to also indicate that the CDC guidelines, where they suggest that if everyone is immunized, uh, indoors, you don't have to wear masks. That's specifically for small groups. Now, they don't define small groups, but even if we knew the status of the vaccination, and as President Armacost indicates, we don't, um, it would not apply to a lot of the things that we do indoors, where it's not uh, the five or six people that was mentioned in the question. Uh, so I think given all of those factors, I completely agree with what President Armacost said. And let me point out again, the fastest way 
the, uh, that we can get maskless is to get vaccinated. The latest data for the state of North Dakota for a 19 to 29 year olds, which would encompass a lot of the students at UND, the latest percentage of those students who were fully vaccinated, that is more than two weeks after the first or the second shot for the two, two shot regimes is 22%. So less than a quarter of all of the people in that age group had been vaccinated. We wanna get classes without masks, get vaccinated. Thank you. A question for, and this probably could go to just about anybody um, in the Zoom, um, and probably one that many of us will be asking for years to come. How would you summarize, so I'm going to just open it up, and whether it's the President, Jed, Josh, um, but here's the question that likely dissertations will be written upon. Um, how would you summarize the impact that COVID had at UND, given the resiliency that college-age kids have to this, though not necessarily staff and faculty? Did UND experience any serious hospitalizations? Given hindsight and experiences other universities had, what worked well and what would you have done differently? And then this person ends with, thank you for the hard work, which thank you for the comments. So thoughts on any looking back for those? Okay, Kara's already waving her hands. So Dr. Hogren. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I yeah. think when I, for me personally, when I look at it, um, students are resilient. And I think over the last year, we found out that we are too. And you know we've had students that have been hospitalized previously for other things, not necessarily COVID related. And we have some incredible systems in place. And I think that as a result of having those systems in place to support students and to work with faculty and um, provide really kind of a web of support, when COVID came, we already knew how to do that work well. And so COVID was just another, um, a, another kind of uh, piece to it, another variable that we had to consider. But again, I, I'm, I would look at it and say, you know, there's probably, you know, things that we would look at and say, maybe we should have done differently. But again, given what we had, I'm, I'm really proud of what we've, what we've done and what we've done with students. Yeah, I, I also think this is a wonderful question, but I would actually frame it a little differently. And I think to me, the question is, uh, what was the effect that COVID had and our part in it for uh, Grand Forks County? Because a lot of the, uh, a lot of the uh, steps that we took were not just for the um, you know, health and well-being of our university community, but they affected Grand Forks County as well. And the reason why I say it is, if you figure there's what, like about 62,000 people in Grand Forks, and you're introducing uh, thousands of uh, college students into that community, which is a high percentage of college students relative to the total population of the city, uh, then we're, we have to look out not only for, and we're dealing with a highly transmissible disease, then we have to look out not only for our own community, but I think for the greater Grand Forks community. And so uh, that's an interesting question. And I think it's one where uh, the results still need to be written. Uh, and I'm looking forward to really understanding whether or not we made a difference in reducing the hospitalization rate and of course, sadly, the death rate uh, in our county versus other counties in the state. So, uh, but, but I kind of think we probably did. Um, I think we, to the extent that we could, we knocked down some of the transmission rates and by the efforts of our entire community, and putting, you know, testing people vigorously, putting them in uh, quarantine and isolation, either at home or in hotels, which we provided them. I think by definition, we took out some of the gas uh, from the, um, you know, from the pandemic, which I believe, I don't know for sure, but I believe would have been worse for our community had we, you know, been much more passive. I, I agree with Jed's comments. I think from a, uh physical health point of view, um, we collectively did pretty well, all things considered. On the other hand, the emotional toll that the pandemic has taken, particularly on students 
but also faculty and staff, but especially on students has been enormous. And I do think that we, the university stepped up and tried to make as available as we could counseling and other support services, but the impact on students has been palpable. Uh, the, the good news is there, you, the students in there who are listening, you are resilient and I think you're already rebounding, but I just want to assure parents and students that we are aware of the emotional toll that this took and we have worked hard to try to, uh, to, try to ad address it. Um, I plan, uh, we're not doing it too much more, but I'm gonna to go to one of my first meditation sessions that the School of Medicine and Health Sciences is having at over the lunch hour. So I look forward to participating in that and uh, seeing if that might help a little bit. Uh, but I do think that um, we, uh, I have been impressed as far as the emotional impact. And again, I think we had good systems in place and we responded well uh, but I think we've learned just how um, important that component has been. And uh, let me also add just the uh, incredible investment uh, that the university and really the federal government and the state government made to make us, to allow us to have um, everything that we needed, uh, whether it's investment in testing, in investment in um, contact tracing and so forth. But on our campus, we spent, uh, and Jed, correct me up, correct me on the numbers, but about 35 million um, since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and uh, the majority, the vast majority of that was was reimbursed by uh, the federal and state governments. So um, it's really been, whether it's uh, changing air handlers or buying cleaning equipment or uh, reconfiguring rooms or developing uh, better hybrid uh, technology to support classes, um, it's an expensive proposition to make the changes that we made. And I'm, I'm extraordinarily proud of the work the campus did. We had a pandemic uh, group that has worked since March 11th. Uh, uh, initially, it was for five days a week. Uh, I think it currently meets two or three days a week. And, um, and uh, they've just done an incredible job bringing their expertise uh, to bear on how do we respond in the best way possible uh, to the pandemic, balancing our desire to keep things going on campus with, with the need to minimize the risk uh, to our campus members. So I'm really proud of, of all the work that everybody's done. Thanks, everybody. Melanie, a question for you. People are thinking ahead to future commencements. So are we planning for an in-person summer or I'll call it August commencement? And if so, what's the date? <laughs> we are planning to go back in-person commencement. We all are, are very excited about that. It is Friday, August 6th. There'll be two commencements, one for undergrad and one for graduates. And Melanie, I'm going to add to that. Information will be shared to those students who have not yet been able to enjoy an in-person commencement that they would be able to participate in that event, correct? That is correct. Every student who has not been able to participate in an in-person commencement throughout the pandemic is going to be invited back to participate in August. And if they can't make the August commencement, we welcome them back at future commencements as well. We are excited to share this big pivotal moment with everyone. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Karen, a question for you. Can asynchronous courses include a Zoom option moving forward? Um, it added, the person adds, frustrating that students pay full price but have to teach themselves with no instructor-led instructor lectures. So just the use of Zoom moving forward. Sure, that's a great question. Um, I want to clarify for online courses, we have two different types. Asynchronous is one type and synchronous is the other type. Our asynchronous courses are meant to be set up so that students do not meet at the same time. So to have a Zoom session, there might be instructors that have them as optional sessions that are built into the course. But if students wanna have a, we all meet together at the same time with a faculty led lecture, they should look for synchronous online courses. We get that question a lot because students are unsure about the difference between the two. Um, so if you want the, the live Zoom sessions, those would be a synchronous online um, and the asynchronous online will continue to, to allow the flexibility, especially for our distance students who are taking those online courses and can't meet at a regular time. Thanks, Karen. Brian Willis, I've got a question for you and we're gonna kind of pivot a little bit from COVID. Um, 
This question um, states, as a parent, I'm extremely concerned about the recent suicide of an aviation student. This year has been stressful on all students, but aviation students are required to maintain a certain GPA. What are you doing to ensure that you are reaching out to those students other than having a counselor available? Are advisors contacting their assigned aviation students? Is the aviation department considering doing anything with regard to the GPA requirement? So maybe just an update for everybody first and what um, the JDO School of Aerospace Sciences has done and maybe some other plans going forward. Yeah, gr great question and, and comments. Um, as Cassie said, I'm Brian Willis, Director of Aviation Safety for um, UND Aerospace. And uh, as we look forward, I guess, uh, with, with, with the recent events of, of the suicide that we um, had just a week, week and a half ago, um, uh, UND Aerospace, we have put together a task force uh, to talk about mental health. We've been discussing this uh, part of our safety seminar or safety week that we did in February. Uh, we pulled in a few professionals uh, because we identified from an aerospace standpoint, uh, flight training can be stressful in itself. And then you throw the pandemic on top of that, uh, along with everything else going on on campus. Uh, we've been trying to nick away at the, at the mental health piece. And, and what we've identified is that this isn't something that you solve in 24 hours or 36 hours or 48 hours. Um, this is something that literally the task force we put together um, spans from students to flight instructors to faculty members, uh, UND Counseling Center, all true members. Uh, we have uh, folks from the community that have joined um, that this is their profession because because we're pilots. And, and when it comes to mental health, um, it's it's not really our topic, but we are digging our, um, you know, go, going knee deep. We're, we're rolling up the sleeves and, and trying to use the help that we can to not set up something for, I'll say that's a short term, uh, what we identified is that we think mental health is going to be uh, an issue that that we face, not because of the pandemic just this year, but they're starting to see it throughout the industry. And so we're trying to develop programs that we can embed in our culture today that will last five years, 10 years, um, and, and beyond. As for what our current staff is, yes, we do have uh, a counselor in a uh, live at um, the, the Odegaard School for students, flight instructors, faculty, uh, whomever that, that wanna take part in and have those conversations. So that is a, a small step. The other one is, is when, when students are dealing with stressful scenarios, whether it be they're out for a period of time due to COVID, uh, we are strongly recommending that they go talk to their faculty members that are teaching those courses. And I, and I think I can probably speak for the majority of the university as well, but we have told our, our, our faculty to be flexible when it comes to uh, those that have missed classes or those that maybe had to take care of a sick family member. Um, those are all things that, that we've had cross our desk. And the biggest thing was we asked that we communicate. So to answer the question, we, we are attempting to, I, I can't say that every advisor is calling every student on the flight line. Um, however, we, we do say that again, what we have those, those means to open that communication um, I'm not sure about the GPA requirements. That's something that I can uh, get back to Cassie on uh, at a later date, uh, but I can work with our Dean's office on, on if there is any um, exceptions there. But I do know flexibility has been uh, part of the message given within the aerospace school where faculty members are hopefully working with students as we approach finals week, final projects and, and things like that, so. Thanks, Brian. I know it's been a um, tough uh, couple weeks for you and your staff, and I will just say to everybody in working with Brian, Brian and our colleagues in aerospace responded immediately, and I think every day have been talking about what more they can do and looking for other ways. So my thanks to everything that Brian and his colleagues have done um, to support our students. So I think truly um, exceptional response um, to a very difficult situation. So my thanks. So a question about um, how we'll know percentage of students vaccinated. So I don't know if this goes to President Armacost or, or you, Dr. Wynn. Um, sometimes we pivot these medical ones to you because you're the only um, doctor on this screen who can write prescriptions. So that's why we come to you sometimes with this or if Rosie has some thoughts. But in light of the fact that we can't ask students who's been vaccinated, how will we know um, what percentage or how many um, members of our campus community, in particular our students, have been vaccinated. Thoughts? 
Rosie has some information on this. Rosie, can, do you want to share that? Go ahead, Rosie. Sure. I can lead with the limited amount of information. Um, the Student Health Center does plan to interface with North Dakota Immunization Information System, the UND um, students. So by interfacing, it means that we have a direct um, connection with the information system that records immunizations. Uh, we already have that in place. So they're hoping to capture the percent of students that are vaccinated at UND in a North Dakota information system. So we'll have an idea about that percentage. However, that system isn't perfect. It doesn't capture students vaccinated outside of North Dakota. So we'll have some idea with that, um, but we won't have great, great, um, great factual information. Um, I don't have much more to add to that, except we go by what the state provides us and the county for that age group percentages of vaccinated persons. And we know that that includes our UND students as well. And I totally, besides the students that we know we vaccinated at, at Student Health so far, I shudder to think of the number, but I, I don't know what was on here, but they vaccinated um, more than a couple thousand, I believe, so far, or around that number. But we also have heard that students have gone to the mass vaccination clinics at the Alaris. So we're just happy they're getting vaccinated. Uh, we don't um, know the exact number, but we just keep encouraging and know that they're getting them. Thanks, Rosie. Uh, uh, I would just add on one comment that she made uh, that the, there are data available, uh, uh, publicly available data by age group. So if you go, if you Google North Dakota Department of Health and then look for dashboard, uh, one of the choices is ND, uh, excuse me, is vaccination status. So if you click on vaccination status, it shows by age group. So if you pick the, the 19 to 29 uh, age or year age group, uh, that will encompass many, not all, but many of our students. And that will give you an idea of how we're doing across the state that does not break it down by institution, but at least that's a publicly available website that you can access. Again, NDDOH dashboard, and then go to vaccination status, and it, it will show that uh, information. And, and Josh, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's no national vaccination registry. Um, so all this data is maintained by each state, and it's, it's really, um, other than our North Dakota citizen students or those who are vaccinated on our campus, it's tough to know the rest of the folks. So, but we'll, we'll look at all the data and try to make a good assessment about that percentage. So thank you all. So another question has come in in response to um, our conversation about the um, aerospace students. So Kara, I'm going to probably pivot this one to you in terms of how notices are spent. And so I don't know, or sent, excuse me, I don't know if you can see it in the chat, but the question for everybody is, it says, I'm the parent of an aviation student, and this is the first time I have heard about a recent suicide of a student. Why weren't parents of aviation students notified about this so that we could discuss this issue with our kids? It is great that the aviation department has brought a counselor in to meet with kids, but parents also need to know when their kids are dealing with serious situations such as this, parents should have been notified. So I don't care if you've got any thoughts to share. Yeah, well, first of all, I would say that um, we always welcome your feedback on, on ways to do this better. And there is, anytime a student dies, it is, it is awful, it is horrible. Um, it, is, it is tragic for the family, it is tragic for the community and those who, who know the student. And so, Again, we have some we have some kind of standard pieces in place that we that we use. So we communicate with the campus typically about um, our notification to them about the death of the student, and that information goes out to all um, people with UND email addresses. Melanie, correct me if I'm wrong there. Okay. The other thing that we do is. Um, in cases like this, we will often include that information to people who are members of the parents listserv that is available through the university. So again, if you're looking for information that is going out in public announcements and you're not a part of that listserv, we would love to make you um, a part of that and we can help you figure out how to sign up for that. 
Um, in terms of, you know, sharing information with, with a particular college about a student, it is always a fine line between um, sharing information that is appropriate to help people versus sharing information about families that is private. And so again, we, um, every situation is a little bit different. And again, we welcome your, your feedback, but please know our intent is not to try and hide information from you or not share. Our intent is to try and provide information in a limited way so that we also um, are able to respect the family who is grieving as they go through something that is just horrible. So again, all feedback is, is helpful. You know, the other piece I will say too is that we know that students uh, have different relationships with students and, you know, we try and reach out where we know that students may be impacted significantly uh, when a student dies, but we don't know about all of those cases. And so if you're a parent out there or you're a student on the line, and you want to talk to somebody further about ways to get some help, ways to get some support, please let us know because we are, are very interested in making sure that people get to the right places um, and feel like that they have the support that they need. And sometimes the hardest thing is to ask for help. But again, um, you just need to know that all of us on the line here are committed to doing that. And so if uh, you let us know, we'll reach out. So we've reached that point where we still have time left and we're happy to answer questions, but we're um, running out of questions. And so um, if you have other questions, please feel free to submit them. I, I did see the follow-up to Dr. Hallgren's comments about um, a parent who is on many of the listservs and blogs. Um, in the past, we have not necessarily, and I need to update Dr. Hallgren as my supervisor and clarify expectations. Um, we have not necessarily forwarded um, notices of student um, deaths to the parents listserv. So um, if we should do that going forward, we certainly can. I should also state that when that notice is shared with campus, um, the circumstances surrounding the death are not included. I think what happens um, as com communities converse um, people find out um, and maybe share some information. And so it's shared through some informal means of communication, but we can also do better in sharing those notices um, with our parents listservs. So our, my apologies for not forwarding that. Thanks, Cassie. I will give it another minute for questions. I do wanna say thanks. Many of you have submitted um, thank yous to us for the work that we have done. Please know we appreciate those. Those are kind comments. We also, um, um, I wanna go back to what people have said. We know that our students have been very resilient and this has been a year of accomplishment for them. We also know they couldn't have done it without the support of parents and family members back home who have taken calls and texts and sent care packages and maybe navigated them through a quarantine or an isolation or search for where they could get a COVID vaccine or helped increase the Wi-Fi network at their apartment complex or whatever the case may be. Um, this was a village that worked together this year of campus faculty, staff, our students and family and parents. And so we just really wanna thank you all as well for everything that you've done to support your students because um, it truly does take all of us working in partnership to support our students. So again, some more thank yous coming in. We do appreciate those. I will also say in case we don't um, get um, to other questions or you have questions, please know once again, if you want to email to me, it's just cassie.gerhart. You can see my name on the screen, add an at und.edu. And I will either um, answer your questions or get them to my colleagues. Again, send me your parking questions. I will gladly send them to Jed and our colleague, Mike Peeper, for appropriate response. I don't go near the parking questions for anything, but I know Jed and Mike would love to answer those, but feel free to send them my way. Um, I'm just... Troy, maybe the, I know there's a couple of questions that I think you might be trying to type, but as we think to um, move out coming in just the not so distant future, do you want to just update everybody on plans for the move out process um, coming in the coming days and weeks? Yeah, Cassie, this is Troy again. Um, I was just typing in the answer there, but um, we, we have not initiated this the specific question was, are there any limitations as far as two hour move out window as we did last spring? At this point, we haven't implemented any limitations on time. We would just ask um, that students and their families 
um, continue to help us in uh, respecting the social distancing as well as just um, try not to create longevity where there doesn't need to be longevity. So the faster we can get people moving out and, and, and get their stuff transitioned out of the building, it'll just create a, a, a safer environment for everyone. But no, there is not a specific two hour limit this year. Troy, there's another question about move in for summer. I'm assuming that is communicated directly to the students who are with us this spring and then um, transitioning to summer housing. Yeah, um, I didn't see that one, but it's a specific question about um, where to move in or, or just it's details. about on. how is move out for this semester and move in for the summer being handled. So just the move in for the summer piece, sorry. Yeah, move in will um, be handled. Um, we The numbers are, are are not as much as what we would have in the fall semester. And so we don't have any specific um, distancing precautions put in place. So students will get information about their move in time or, or their move in process um, in their email when they get their assignments. If you have questions, I would just um, contact us directly and we sure can go through those one by one with people. Thanks, Troy. Again, I will do kind of a last call for questions. Um, we did get a couple of thank yous from students. So, so thank you for the students who are with us tonight, probably wrapping up um, projects for the spring semester, getting ready for finals. And so thanks for your um, kind words as well. We can't wait to see you in person this fall. Since I am not seeing, um, oh, Troy and Kara, here's one for you. Um, the question is how come some of the halls are being closed for the fall semester? There is a great Grand Forks Herald article out there right now that talks about um, some things that we are hoping to do with our residence halls over the next year. We are looking at the possibility of taking down West Hall and McVeigh Hall and renoing Brandon Hall, which means that we are not using those halls for the fall of this next year. This isn't final yet, but this is our hope. And so we hope to have some more information for you real soon, but that's why um, some of those spaces aren't available for fall. And Dr. Hallgren, you said we're taking down McVeigh and West. Are we just taking them down? Good point, President Armacost. We are taking them down and we are building something bigger and better. So um, we are excited about creating new housing spaces for our students that they will be excited about. So again, more information to come. Well, I am not seeing another question. And so this is the point, President Armacost, where I'm gonna turn it over to you for some final comments. Great, well, thank you. And uh, let me thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, this evening. Again, if you have follow-up questions or things we just didn't get to, um, please uh, do write in and we'll get you the answers as quickly as possible. The, uh, I just, this is the end of my first full academic year on campus. And it's just been a joy working with these great colleagues that you see on, on the screen. But the most important thing are the great students that we have. And um, I'm, I'm always amazed that when I walk around campus and I just engage with, with our students, how kind they are, how hardworking they are. They're, they're gonna be great leaders for, for our society and they're gonna do some wonderful things after they graduate from UND. Um, family members, you should be proud of what you've done. You got them ready uh, to br bring them into this college environment. And uh, we've, we've uh, done a lot here to further develop them, to educate them, to give them opportunities to grow. And, uh, and you should be really proud parents, family members, grandparents, aunts, uncles, um, whoever's on tonight, uh, you've done great work. And um, we know that these students are gonna go do great things. So with that, let me sign off, wish everybody a great spring, um, a happy commencement day coming up on the 15th. And uh, we really appreciate you dialing in tonight. So uh, we'll talk soon. <laughs>